Hi, good evening, everybody. Are we ready to get started? Yeah, and get started on time this evening. Hi, everyone. I think everyone in this room uh, knows me. I'm Michelle DePass, and I'm part of the, the cohort of uh, professors here at the New School that are uh, putting on and executing and designing the race in the United States class. And welcome to uh, this evening's class. Uh, you are in for an incredible treat. Uh, your lecture tonight is going to is entitled "Our Brains on Race: Implicit Bias, Racial Anxiety, and Stereotype Threat." Uh, I am going to read you uh, most of the bio of Professor Rachel Gotzel and then ad lib a little bit because I have been really fortunate to know Professor Gotzel for uh, a long time, <laughs> uh, several decades. And so um, Rachel Godsell is the director of research and co-founder of the Perception Institute. She collaborates with social scientists on empirical research to identify the efficacy of interventions to address implicit bias, racial anxiety, and stereotype threat. She regularly leads workshops and presentations addressing the role of bias and anxiety associated with race, ethnicity, religion, and gender, focusing on education, criminal justice, healthcare, and the workplace. Godsell is the lead author of the Perception Institute reports, including Pop Justice, Volume 3, Pop Culture, Perceptions, and Social Change, and The Science of Equality, Volume 1, Addressing Implicit Bias, Racial Anxiety, and Stereotype Threat in Education and Healthcare. In addition to many articles and book chapters, such as The Moral Ecology of Policing, A Mind Science Approach to Race and Policing in the United States in the Rutledge Handbook of Criminal Justice Ethics, and many, many, many law review articles such as race, ethnicity, and place identity, implicit bias, and competing belief systems, which is in the Hawaii Law Review. She has also co-authored amicus briefs on behalf of empirical social psychologists in both iterations of Fisher v. Texas and the National Parent Teacher Association in the parents involved in community schools versus Seattle School District litigation at the Supreme Court. In addition to her role at the, with the Perception Institute, Rachel is a professor of law and chancellor scholar at Rutgers Law School. And her research focuses on applying insights from the mind sciences to race, law, and public policy. Her recent property work focuses on gentrification, the mortgage crisis, and eminent domain, as well as the intersection of race, poverty, and land use decisions. Rachel has served as the chair of the New York City Rent Guidelines Board in 2014 and 2015, not an easy position. After serving as the convener for a president former President Obama's campaign, Urban and Metropolitan Policy Committee, and an advisor to the Department of Housing and Urban Development Transition Team, Professor Godsell co-directed a report to HUD Secretary Sean Donovan entitled, Retooling HUD for a Catalytic Federal Government. During law school, Rachel served as the executive article editor of the Michigan Law Review. And after graduation, she clerked for John Walker as Second Circuit Court of Appeals. She was an assistant US attorney for the Southern District of New York, associate counsel of the NAACP Legal Defense and Educational Fund, focusing on environmental justice, as well as an associate with several law firms. So I am telling you, you are in for an incredible treat, somebody who has uh, previously was also a professor at Seton Hall Law. So really what you are going to be uh, experiencing tonight is, uh, is the combination of uh, knowledge from a lot of different sectors, a lot of different places in society. And Professor Rachel Godsell is a phenomenal woman. She is, has been a lifelong friend to me, and her wisdom that she brings to the table as one of the best civil rights lawyers uh, and now social science researchers on perception and bias uh, is really amazing. And she has supported a lot of different nonprofit uh, people out there, a lot of different academic institutions, a lot of different governments. And uh, when you are struggling, I'll tell you, when you are a struggling nonprofit director, you, like I was, uh, as the executive director of the New York City Environmental Justice Alliance, you, and you're dealing with race, class, 
and gender issues. You want to have a professional a warrior like Rachel Gonsal by your side. So I am honored and thankful that she accepted Derek Hamilton and Maya Wiley and my invitation to come and talk with you tonight. She will give, be giving you a lecture on uh, bias uh, for about an hour or so, and then we will be having questions and answers, and I really hope that we have a robust discussion. Welcome, Professor Rachel Gonsal. All right, I feel like I sound really boring now, and I can never live up to all of those long, long accolades. Uh, it's, it's a pleasure to be here. And I would actually start by saying part of the reason I do this work is because of Michelle DePass. When I was at LDF at the NAACP Legal Defense Fund doing environmental justice work, Michelle was the, at the helm of the Environmental Justice Alliance. And here I was, a 25-year-old white woman, like not really knowing what to do, wanting to be helpful, but I had the potential to be so irritating that I could have like landed in some sort of dust mop somewhere, and Michelle was my partner in this work. And part of what you may be thinking is, why is this white woman up here talking about race? That's a reasonable question. And the reason for that, I think, hopefully is obvious, which is it's all hands on deck. And one of the issues that's become apparent is far too few white people do racial navigation work. We essentially leave it to our colleagues of color, and we duck and hide because we're afraid we'll say the wrong thing, or we you know, sort of, again, put this work on someone else, and that isn't acceptable. It wasn't acceptable then. Uh, it's certainly not acceptable now. And it's been depressing, actually, to have this slide up on my PowerPoint for the last two years. Uh, we've been doing work in the social sciences and this implicit bias work for nine years after the police-involved shootings started to become, you know, feeling like they were sort of constant and omnipresent. I found when we went into communities of color, the reaction first would be, essentially, I feel like my son is you know, sort of there's, a, there's a, a, a X on his back, and I feel like I should always be afraid. And part of the work that we then did with Phil Goff and others is we started working with police departments and prosecutors and judges trying to figure out if they claim to be not wanting to be racist, which they do, why are we seeing what we're seeing? And that's essentially the conundrum and the issue that we address. So pivotal time. One of the questions we sometimes get asked is, isn't this implicit bias, mind science, too individual? Aren't these big systemic problems? Of course they are. So we've got structural issues, institutional issues, and with structures, the broader systems we're up against, institutions, the policies and practices that shape uh, our opportunities. But as you all know, as people walking around every day in the world, the interpersonal matters. The interpersonal interaction between teachers and students matters. The institutional, the inter interpersonal interaction between a healthcare provider and a patient matters. The institution, interpersonal interaction between a correctional officer and someone in prison matters. And institutions are operated by humans. And so we have to get to this work too. It's not a both and. Mm -hmm. As my formerly Marxist father would say, it's a multidimensional protracted struggle. And this is one of those areas. And so I hope that this will be valuable to you in your own life and also to those institutions in which you operate because, again, it's, it's crucial work and it matters to all of us. Now, obviously, explicit bias is real. Explicit bias right now feels omnipresent. It used to be maybe eight months ago or so that when we talk about explicit bias, we would say that there's about 15 or 20 percent of the people in this country who espouse white supremacy loudly and proudly. And we used to say, on the internet in all caps, because that's mainly where they were. And now that's not where they are. Now they're in the streets sometimes. And so again, we're not trying to minimize the, the harm of that. But at the same time, while tackling this, we still have to think about each child in each classroom. And so we're trying to sort of look at this from multiple dimensions. And so the paradox that our work does, so, and again, it's the Perception Institute. Alexis McGill Johnson is the executive director, and she's the person who sort of identified this, this central core paradox. If most people, if most individuals in this country think racism is wrong, consciously think racism not only is wrong, but is actually immoral. There was a study done in Georgia asking people to rate levels of morality. And being racist was considered more immoral than drunk driving, and second only to pedophilia. So being, racism, being racist is something people feel like is immoral, and yet we know, by looking at every bit of information that we have, that our social outcomes don't in no way match the claim that we're 
uh, rejecting racism and egalitarian. So what, how do we explain this once we've got the 15 to 20% kind of hidden in a corner over here? So the, the argument that we'd like to make is we explain this by looking at three phenomena as primary drivers of why individuals who have egalitarian values and who genuinely hold those values nonetheless behave in ways that are antithetical to those values. One is essentially people have deeply misinterpreted Dr. King's dream, right? It was never a dream that suddenly we wouldn't see each other and we should be colorblind. He didn't say, you know, children who are black and children who are white walking hand in hand. Yes, we should be judged by the content of our character, not the color of our skin, but that doesn't mean we erase people's identity as they, as they identify it for themselves and as they proudly claim it. So the colorblindness vision of social justice is deeply destructive in ways that we'll talk about. And it also doesn't work. Like we, you're all, you've all categorized each other and me, right? We do that instantaneously when we look at each other. We put each other in little boxes and we'll talk about that. And then we've got residential segregation because people don't see each other across the yard. They don't see each other in their hallways. They don't see each other at houses of worship or in schools. We're as segregated now as we were shortly after Brown v. Board of Education in 1954. So it's hard to see the world in the same place when you don't live anywhere near each other. And then, of course, there's the media, which is constantly you know, pre pre presenting distorted images of people who you don't see except on television. So this is the paradox, and this is what we would argue are the causes. So the dynamics that we're talking about that we say help to kind of diagnose what the problems are and also offer, we hope, the beginnings of some tools and interventions that people can actually engage in like tomorrow or today as you walk out the door is a combination of what we call implicit bias, racial anxiety, and stereotype threat. Now I want to make one caveat, which is the racial anxiety we're talking about is not racial threat. Sometimes they're used interchangeably, but racial threat is when a group fears the loss of power and dominance. And we know that racial threat is you know, sort of a buzz in the air right now, because a lot of people who are white are worried about losing the position of seeming dominance in the country. And with the demographic shifts, that's triggering some, again, anxiety about losing power. That's not the racial anxiety we're talking about. We're talking about the racial anxiety people feel in an interpersonal way. But again, this is real, and there are other tools we need to, uh, you know, to engage and to work on to address this. So implicit bias. It starts with the way our brains operate. Our brains essentially have, you know, sort of categorized everything we see and we put them into categories and that is what allows us to function. And that's, again, just the way our brains operate. And we're going to start with, um, you know, understanding that schemas exist in our brain about people and the schemas are not necessarily what we imagine them to be. So when you think of parents, consciously, you may not think of a same-sex couple it, your unconscious is sort of triggering you to think in the same way. So engineer, what comes to mind? You can just think to your head and question, is it a woman? For me, until three weeks ago, an engineer, in, I, without even realizing it, was actually male. And the way I actually became aware of this is I went to UVA to their engineering school, and it was to deal, you know, have a sort of student empowerment session in the morning and a faculty session in the afternoon. And I literally imagined all the students who would come in to talk about talk to us in our empowerment session to be male, and so, was actually surprised when you know half the group was female, and I suddenly realized to myself this claim that I make when I do these lectures about engineers being male that really is in my brain. And spending those three hours with these young women, learning what it was like to be walking into their computer you know computer science classes and to be kind of looked at disdainfully was very meaningful. Now, doctor's interesting, because living in Brooklyn, living in New York, hopefully you have a broad schema when it comes to doctor. I know I certainly do. Um, but how many of you remember what happened on Delta Airlines a little while ago? So Delta Airlines, for those of you who don't recall, uh, there's a patient in distress. And as they always do, they rang the bell to say, is there any doctors in the, in the, on the plane? African-American woman raised her hand. And the flight attendant walked over to her and said, we need an actual doctor. Actual quotes. Looked that up several times. And this woman said, I am an actual doctor. Can I see your credentials? And as they're having this interchange, keep in mind the patient is still in distress. So a woman's being treated wildly disrespectfully and rudely. Patient is in distress. A white male walks by and says, I'm a doctor. Oh, thank you, doctor. So now, question is, if Delta fires said flight attendant, are they done? 
No, right? Is she a racist? Maybe, I don't know. Or is she any of us with the engineer? Again, I'm perfectly happy to say yes, but if Delta's not done, what do we do? What we would argue you do is you come up with a protocol. So when the patient is in distress, someone raises their hand, you say, thank you so much, doctor. Can you show me your credentials so I can know what your level of expertise is? Because what if the white guy was Leonardo DiCaprio pretending to be a doctor? Anyone see that goofy movie? Are we going to send anyone over to do a tracheotomy? So again, it's not unreasonable to ask for someone's credentials. But obviously, so the, the sending the white guy over was as you know, sort of not troubling in the racial sense, but for this patient could have been. Uh, so this is sort of what this work is about, is figuring out how do we work with what we know people's schemas to be to produce behaviors that are, aren't consistent with those noxious schemas. And so one of the things to think about is, again, if you have behaviors that are horrific, that's the harm. It's not the harm that's in the back of our brain. Of course, another big question is how the stereotypes that exist about people beyond roles. Because each of us has, obviously, multiple identities. We have, again, sort of our gender, our race, our religion, our gender expression our age, a whole host of things that are part of who we are. And each of those categories has a set of stereotypes or traits associated with them and attitudes, feelings, warmth or coldness associated with them. And it turns out we can have warm feelings and negative stereotypes and vice versa. And an example of this are people who are considered elder. Turns out we have very warm feelings about people who are considered elder, but we often have stereotypes about their competence. And this includes people who fit into that category themselves. But then another question comes up with respect to categories like ethnicity. Why do stereotypes about some groups persist and other groups, they sort of go into the dustbin of history? I don't know how many of you are sort of Irish history fans, probably not too many, but I'm Irish Catholic, and so I'm sort of interested in the history of people who are like me uh, in some sense. And I, I'm the one on the left, or my left, you're right. I'm Bridget McBruder in the 19th century. Irish Catholic, particularly working class, shanty Irish, as we're called, shanty Irish women, when contrasted with Protestant women, were considered subhuman, savage, uneducable, promiscuous, and drunk. Now, of those stereotypes, are any of you aware of any of them now? When you hear Irish, what do you think? Let's be honest. Drunk, right? For some reason, we always giggle, right? When you say Irish and drunk, it's kind of weirdly funny. Now, I actually have alcoholism running rampant in my family, to be perfectly honest. But even I somehow laugh when I think of Irish and drunk. And it's because there's not a social stigma attached to the drunk Irish anymore. People have this image of some like happy little person wearing a green hat and telling funny stories. If I had used the same words, and I had an image of someone Native American, and I had referred to that person as drunk, that would have had a totally different effect, right? First of all, I couldn't self-identify as Native American, so it would be very pro deeply problematic for me to be making these dispersions. Second of all, the current social stigmatization around Native Americans and alcoholism continues to be powerful, and it continues to be an impediment to people who are Native American and how they are seen as they walk through the world. So then the question comes, why do the Irish, why do those stereotypes disappear about the Irish? Why are we only thinking in kind of mildly amused ways about the Irish uh, being <laughs> drunk? Well because we became white, right? The Irish went from being, in some sense, its own race, which they were, according to some definitions of race, to becoming white along with the other white ethnics. So it used to be that you know, Poles and Germans and Italians and other white ethnics were seen as sort of separate categories of people. And the KKK disliked the Catholics, the Irish Catholics, uh, as much as it did African Americans, as much as it did Jews. So they used to be sort of a, a hated class. And how did that change? It wasn't random. It changed because in post-World War II United States, the government handed out you know, enormous amounts of money, frankly, to those who were white and put enormous amounts of money into transportation systems that allowed all these people who suddenly were kind of given the ability to purchase a home. You had working class families suddenly purchasing homes to move out into those suburbs and create little white enclaves and literally put red lines around neighborhoods that had people of color in them. And you couldn't get a mortgage backed, a government backed mortgage, if you lived in a neighborhood that had African American or Latino or, in some places, Asian American. 
the, the government wouldn't grant you that mortgage and the private banks followed. So it was you know, government programs that transformed essentially a fairly you know, kind of multi-segmented society into this much greater binary that we now live in. Now, of course, we know the binary isn't real, and we know it's much more multifaceted than that, but this whole idea of white was created largely by the government as a result of these programs. And so what's fascinating in some sense to me is that the same stereotypes that were applied to the white ethnics for decades on welfare, took the jobs of the real Americans. If you were Polish, Italian, or German, refused to speak English. If you were Irish, certainly had too many kids. All of those stereotypes are alive and well, but they're now imposed on people who are seen as Latino. And this is a news analysis by one of the people who we collaborate with regularly. And what's ironic, of course, is you've got Fox, Network News, and MSNBC. These stereotypes aren't all of them. So it's not just the right wing who are perpetuating these stereotypes. It's across the board. And this is how people then are seen. Because remember, we don't know each other you know, sort of from our backyards or our schools. And then there's the decades of depictions of African Americans as poor. And again, it's one of these sort of tragedies, in a sense, that many of the people who worked in the network news magazines or the weekly news magazines who had the depictions of African Americans as poor were thinking of themselves as trying to help. They were thinking of themselves as raising the light on an issue that demanded public attention. But what they actually were doing was deeply distorting the image and feel in the country of who was poor and taking from that who essentially was benefiting from government programs. The largest number of poor people in this country are white people, 19 million of us, 12 million poor Latinos, 10 million poor black people. But when people think, when you think of the poor, when you think of who benefits from government programs, mainly because we don't understand math very well, right? So in terms of like you had these tables, but we don't have the raw number, so we, our math problem. So I'll do a lot of stats. That's my recommendation to you. So that's again, it's an enormous challenge because we have this over exaggeration and this assumption about who's taking and who's making, and you know, I'm I'm the one who's taking. So you're going to say to yourself, well, I don't watch television news because you know, I don't have time for that, which is great. Um, and so I don't have any of these implicit biases in my head. And I'll challenge you on this a little bit, because this was a project that looked at the words, newspapers, magazines, and other you know, sort of written material that the average college uh, level student would read in a lifetime. And what it looked at were how frequently certain sort of words were seen together with respect to groups. And this is what they found. And I, and I understand this is a binary. And again, we're going to try and sort of give you more research that's more multifaceted. But this one is a, a sort of a, a binary that is, it gives us an example of the kind of thing we're talking about. So if you look at the stereotypes and the words that are linked and the concepts that are linked when you, and contrast black and white and contrast female and male, you're seeing how, what's being poured into our brain as we read all the things that we read. And so again, we get to this question of who's poor? Who, well, now you know because I have a picture up. In New York City, the group most likely to be poor is Asian American. But that's not seen. And often by government officials even, it's not seen. So often, again, people go without help because they're not seen. And we have a set of stereotypes about who Asian Americans are that belies a reality that they experience. And then, of course, we have this notion of gender. Those stereotypes that I showed you linked to gender you know, sort of warm, passive, and you know, distant. Those are essentially a stereotypes that see gender as white. If we look at most studies that are done that call themselves studies about gender in the social sciences, the subjects in those studies are almost invariably, you know, sort of ninety percent plus white women. And so what that means is, from a social science perspective, there's a great deal that isn't known about the stereotypes that women of color are experiencing. And it's also, again, it's just absurd to say this is a study about gender and only have one group. That's a study about white women. That's fine. But again, name what we're doing. And so these are sort of anecdotal what people feel. If you're, you know, again, these are uh, that we're told from Asian American women seen as passive, Latina seen as attitudinal, for black women seen as angry. And one thing that's distinct for African American women or black women is if you're black and dark skinned, race trumps gender. And so black women often have the negative stereotypes that black men are shouldering also imposed upon them. 
And these negative stereotypes have incredibly powerful effects. So people looking at identical sized images of a black and white man, and this is actually, you know, again, multiracial participants in the study, identical sized uh, met black and white men judge the black men to be bigger, stronger, more muscular, and more capable of uh, causing harm than the identically sized white men. And the white participants in the study concluded that the police would be more justified in using force even if they were unarmed. That's a March, 17, uh, March 13, 2017 study. Which brings us to this concept of implicit bias. Our brain's automatic, instant association of stereotypes and attitudes toward particular groups without our being consciously aware of it. And I say without our being consciously aware of it, but I want to be, I want, I want to be clear, knowing that we have implicit biases or automatic associations doesn't get rid of them. It's a beginning, but it doesn't make them go away once we know we have them. It just begins the work, hopefully. So how do we know that we have them? Well, there's the implicit association test, the IAT. How, and have any of you taken this? Okay, so a decent number of you. So the IAT can be found, please don't take it now because it will hurt my feelings, but you can Google uh, IAT or Project Implicit, and there's a whole host of uh, sort of little exercises you can do that will allow you to see how quickly your brain can associate some groups with some images, and it gives you a sense of where your vulnerabilities are. It's not a DNA test, and it's actually been methodologically critiqued. Lawyers got really excited when the IAT came out, and we said, all right, we're going to have everybody take the IAT, and everybody who has bias, if you're a police officer, you're fired. If you're a teacher, you're fired. If you're a juror, you're knocked off the jury. If you're a judge, you're fired. If you're, you know, on and on and on. We'd have nobody left because literally there isn't a human being alive who doesn't have some implicit biases against some identity groups. And having implicit biases doesn't mean that we act on them. It's not an excuse. It's the beginning of understanding how our brains operate. So here's an example that's sort of interesting that both shows this sort of way implicit bias operates and also shows how it can have some, how we can sort of work through something slightly differently. So uh, it used to be that orchestras had a very strong tendency to hire uh, men, male uh, uh, musicians over female auditions. And of course, the people who were hiring thought that the men were just better. And someone suggested, well, why don't we put up a screen? And that will tell us whether or not we're hiring based upon something other than talent. So they put up a screen, and initially, there weren't that many changes in the percentage of women who were hired. And so that, of course, made the people who were doing the auditions feel very proud. But then someone noticed that for some uh, auditions but not others, there was a little click, click, click sound before the audition. Anyone know what the click, click, click sound? Heels. And literally, that auditory cue of heels was enough to sort of change the way people were listening. So now orchestras literally make people take off their shoes or they'll put like a little rug because they want to prevent the auditory cues from affecting the way you listen. And it's, what's amazing is after doing this, they increased orchestral seats for females between 25 and 46%. So that's a remarkable one. Now this is, healthcare is probably the area that's been most studied and that's in part, or in significant part, because in 2007, there was a study of medical residents who were given, you know, sort of patient uh, instruments. They'd taken the race IAT, the race uh, implicit association test, a few weeks before. Um, but this was weeks after, so they didn't have any notion that these were connected. And they were asked to diagnose the particular cardiac conditions and then to recommend treatment. And what they found in this 2007 study was that those with higher levels of implicit bias against African Americans were able to diagnose correctly across group, but they didn't recommend the same treatment. They were significantly less likely to recommend the gold standard treatment. So that completely, as it should, freaked everybody out. And so there's been an enormous amount of work done in medicine around this issue. And what's very positive is in recent studies, 2014, 2016 studies, the link between implicit bias and treatment recommendations when the protocol is clear, when there's an obvious treatment, is, has been broken. Now, where medicine still has a long way to go is on more subjective determinations like pain medication. So there was a recent study of children going to the ER, 4,000 children going to the emergency room for appendicitis. And what they were measuring was whether or not white and black children were apt to get the same level of pain medication. And they found that white children reporting severe pain were three times more likely to receive the appropriate opiate pain medication than black children. 
Do doctors wake up in the morning not want, you know, wanting to cause pain? I don't think so. But this is what happens. And again, the argument is this has happened because of um, uh, implicit associations. So I know these are the creepiest looking people alive. I acknowledge that. Um, so you would think that, and I actually kind of think the white one's a little creepier, to be honest myself. Um, so you would think that these would uh, not be sort of necessarily seen uh, differently. But when people are asked to do a little sort of, uh, you have like a little screen in front of you and you have to press the button when the face become, moves from being angry to happy, with the creepy white face, they press the button on number three and it takes all the way to number four for the identical face simply with darker skin and a different hair color. And there's, again, a host of studies that show it can be difficult to see sort of the subtle emotions across race. So we can see anger, we can see happiness, but we can't see anguish, we can't see hope. And those subtle emotions are what allow us to have empathy for each other. Implicit bias shows. If you have implicit biases toward a particular group, it is often reflected in your body language. And of course, we all know at some level that we tend to think of body language as more true than people's words. And so if we have implicit biases and we're showing them in the way that we're looking at people or not looking at them, they're likely to receive it, even though consciously that is not at all what we intend, which is, again, why this work is so important for teachers and healthcare providers and anyone who has uh, meaningful interactions with people. So there's, again, gender bias in uh, applications, like where, again, identical resumes are sent in and competence, hireability, mentoring, salary. Uh, men and women are treated differently. Uh, this one was in, my, in uh, Michelle in my fields, in the, in the law field, where uh, law firm partners were sent identical memos and were asked to judge the quality of the memo to determine whether they'd be interested in hiring the person. When it was a person named Tom, when they thought it was a person named Tom Meyer who uh, went to NYU and was a third year associate, they found on average 2.9 of the seven spelling and grammatical errors. When they thought it was someone black, literally twice as many, 5.8 out of seven. They judged white Tom Meyer's memo to be quite good, 4.1 out of five, black Tom Meyer, 3.2 out of five. They couldn't believe black Tom Meyer went to NYU. The identical memo. I shared this with law firm partners this morning. So again, we think of ourselves as being able to be objective, but it's really hard. There's a lens. Now, if the memo written by Black Tom Meyer had been perfect, they would have seen that, and they would have been all excited. But one mistake, and they become hypervigilant. And so it allows them to have these stereotypes coming into play and affecting the work that they see people do. Now again, for Asian Americans, there's this notion of being sort of the model minority, all this sort of positive treatment. But what if you are a lawyer and you don't want to be a patent lawyer? You know, you want to be a litigator. Well, a colleague of ours, Jerry Kong, did a study where people listened to an identical voice doing a deposition. And the question was, you know, would you hire this person? Are they warm? Are they assertive? And the white guy was seen as warm and assertive and someone who I hire to represent my family. And the identical voice, if people thought it was Asian American, not so much. The other thing that tends to happen is we, when we have an in-group, we tend to attribute the mistakes that the in-group has made to, you know, their traffic was really heavy or uh, the subway was late or they were in another meeting that was really important. We, you know, we give the benefit of the doubt and we look at context. But if it's not our group, our tendency is to think time management issues. It's the person. We, we link it to the person. It's called attributional error. And in terms of Academia, this was a study that was done, again, very recently, where identical memos were sent you know, to uh, academics in various fields, I'm sorry, identical emails, and the only difference was what ethnicity or race the names connoted. And this chart over here is measuring the rate of response relative to white males. And as you can see, every single other group had a far lower response rate compared to white males. So now we get to racialized memories. This is, a, again, a phenomenon that's deeply troubling because it means so much when we think of the criminal justice context. If you hear a story about someone named William, you then hear a story, or, so half the group hears a story about someone named William, half the group hears a group about someone named Tyrone. They're distracted for 15 minutes. They come back, and with William, they forget a bunch of the hostile facts or aggressive facts. With Tyrone, they remember all the aggressive details, and in fact, they make up some that weren't actually there. Now, do they make it up consciously? Probably not. They have no reason to, but they do. So again, 
What about when we seeing threat? This is a study that's been done multiple times. You see pixelated images, and the question is, do you see crime-related uh, uh, images faster than you see non-crime-related images? And it turns out, if we have no, uh, if we have no filter or no prime, we see crime-related and non-crime-related about the same level. But if we're primed, even with the faces of little kids, five-year-old black boy, five-year-old white boy, you see the toy faster with one and the gun faster with the other. So. Here's a question. Do any of these sound familiar? Where are you from? And where are you really from? Oh, you must have had such a difficult childhood. Your work is really quite good. It's interesting. I don't think of you as. I love Asian food. So these are all the kinds of, again, small interpersonal statements that are often made, but somehow they're only made to people in one group rather than another. And again, if it's made once, that doesn't sort of, it may be kind of obnoxious, but if it's over and over and over again, it becomes something that you're sort of navigating, it becomes burdensome. So what do we do? There are a set of interventions that any of us can engage in to reduce bias, and we would certainly encourage all of you to engage in these. It's time consuming, and we're never gonna reduce all of our biases, but if you identify a group who you potentially have power over, this is obviously worth doing. So the first thing you do is identify behaviors. In the study that was done, it was done at the University of Wisconsin, one of the women in the study talked about how she suddenly realized, when she started thinking about it, that when one of her black college, college classmates walked by her, she'd do the flinch. Now, I used to think the flinch was a joke, but obviously the flinch is not a joke. It's a thing that happens all the time. And she, what she realized is every time she does this, she's communicating to someone, I think you're dangerous. And so this is on her, because if you think about the actual risk of any sort of violence toward a white female college student, it is either someone in our family or, frankly, someone in a fraternity house. And I'm actually just being candid about statistics. So this is a you know, mirage based upon a stereotype, but it's having harm. So then you sort of begin this process of trying to break down the stereotypes in your brain with counter-stereotypical images. But then most importantly, we have to learn to individuate. And what we, people mean when they say that is learn to see people simultaneously as the group to which they identify and for their individual unique characterizations as people. And the reason the first one's important, and this is why colorblindness is such a disaster, because first of all, we, like, why would we not, why is it not okay to see each other with different hues of skin? Why is that a problem? It's only a problem if we then, you know, lap onto that all these negative associations. So the colorblindness, our brain doesn't do that. And if people do the sort of I don't see you as, it means the positive individual qualities you notice in people who you interact with, you don't then allow to begin to break down the stereotypes about the group. So our brain has to do two things. If someone self-identifies as a particular group, you see that, and then you see them for the unique human being they are. That's individuating. And then perspective taking is also really important, but there's a tendency to do perspective taking from your own perspective or from my own perspective. So if we perspective take in the way that works out badly, it's thinking about the Michael Brown incident in Ferguson. Well, I don't know why he didn't just step on the curb. You know, when a police officer asks me to step on the curb, I just step on the curb. He says, you know, please, ma'am, would you step on the curb? And I say, oh, of course, officer, have a lovely day. Well, that's obviously not perspective taking that has any meaning for Michael Brown's life. That's perspective taking from my life as a 50, soon to be 50 year old white woman and my experiences. And so that's not real perspective taking. And then finally, and most importantly, the only way to truly, truly reduce implicit biases in any way that's long-term and meaningful is to have peer-to-peer intergroup contact that leads to authentic relationships of trust and intimacy. That's really interesting. It doesn't have to mean sex. Can I say that? Sorry. Um, so, so that's the only way truly to reduce implicit biases. And that has to be peer-to-peer. -peer. I gave this presentation to, to judges, and I had a judge who said, well, I have intergroup contact all the time. And I said, oh, that's wonderful, judge. Where do you have that? In my courtroom. It's like, I don't think that's what we're talking about. I think that's when you have a lot of power over people, and they're coming in at their most vulnerable. So I think you got to learn something else. So now, the, inter the interest in uh, increasing inter intergroup contact, again, it has to be reciprocal, and it has to lead to this kind of, again, at opportunities to truly know each other. And so hopefully, again, this is something that you're having and this is something you're experiencing. But every single one of us, every human of whatever race, ethnicity, gender, gender expression, we all have implicit biases against some group. 
And you're all going to have power at some point. You might have power now. And you have power in some sense in your interactions now. So the thing that we have to all do, particularly once we gain any power, is do the work of bias override. And that has to, beginning, has, has to begin rather with doubting our objectivity. One of the things that is, has become apparent as we do this work is there's a group of us, and sort of the happy white liberal of whom I probably used to be, who we think you know, we're good. Other people have that problem, but we're, we're, we're good. If we don't doubt our objectivity, we have the potential to do harm, because it's presuming that we're all good that leads us to make decisions that have effects. So again, if you've got power, you want to count and see what you're doing. You want to sort of think about the criteria you're using for making decisions and being mindful about inter uh, interaction dynamics. So all this is work that we have to do. But the problem is that I don't know how you're all feeling right now, but often hearing about all this utterly depressing you know, sort of research can leave people both depressed and anxious. So depressed because it feels intractable, although I will argue, again, using the medical school example, there's a lot we can do to actually sort of break apart the bias from the behavior. But then there's also the anxiety, the worry about, am I going to say or do something that makes me sound racist? If I'm a person of color, am I going to experience this on the receiving side? And that can actually be extraordinarily harmful as well. So we actually don't talk about implicit bias without talking about racial anxiety because, again, if we're thinking about the importance of the human interaction, which is part of obviously part of what we think is crucial, we have to understand what happens. Um, so this racial anxiety, again, there's an interesting study where people were given propanolol, which I guess is like a beta blocker, and then asked to take that implicit association test. And it actually completely eliminated implicit bias. So my colleague Alexis said we should put like Xanax in the water or something. So we, so okay, it could be it could be a way to work, but I think we're probably not going to have that happen. Fluoride was enough. So how do we experience racial anxiety? It's again experienced differently depending upon how you're situated. So for a person of color, the worry or the anxiety or the or the the concern is experiencing discrimination, hostile treatment, or invalidation, and that's obviously born from experience. But when that anxiety comes into the interaction, it's seen by then the white person who is worried, you know, we worry that we're going to say or do something that's going to make us sound racist. And remember, we think racists are immoral. So the anxiety on both sides can be very high. And what the anxiety often looks like is people sort of, you know, not give, having eye contact, standing a little further away, having colder body language, avoiding the interaction altogether, or then there's just being awkward. So the, you know, sort of example that we gave this summer was when a white person walks up to a person of color they don't know very well, I saw hidden figures. And I saw get out, too. And you have this expression on your face like, right? I'm good, right? And I did that example because my colleague Alexis had had that happen to her four times in, uh, in, South, in Alabama, rather. And the person who invited me, an African-American doctor, came up to me. And she was just cracking up. And she said her supervisor was sitting next to her. And he literally done that exact thing the day before with the same ridiculous expression on his face. So he was sitting there obviously feeling ridiculous. And it's a, again, it's an attempt to connect, but it's an attempt to connect that shows the anxiety. The person is so worried about not saying something wrong that they have, again, sort of the, the race and concern in the front of their head. So this is sort of the work we have to move past. And then there's something that the social scientists refer to as the stress of racial disappointment. So within progressive spaces, there's the hope that all of this will be different, that we'll actually, as individuals, be able to interact with, again, that simultaneous recognition of people's identities as they self-identify and their unique human characteristics. And there's a hope that there's not going to be the kind of, again, ridiculous things that are said or the invalidation or the kinds of interactions that occur. And if we talk the talk but don't walk the walk, that can actually be emotionally more taxing than if someone's already braced themselves for something that's going to happen. And so it makes it really important in progressive spaces for every, you know, so again, for us to work through all of this. So this is an interesting body of work done by social psychologists who were looking at the, the experiences of people of color navigating predominantly white institutions and largely college campuses. And they were interested in whether race affected what people were looking for in their interactions. And they found uh, that it did. So for most of the white students, the goal in a cross-race interaction was to be liked. 
So the question was kind of which, would you, which is more important, to be liked or respected? And essentially, most of the white students presumed that we'd be respected, and so we wanted to be liked. And for the black and Latino students, there was not a presumption of respect. And so that, that respect had to come first. The problem is the way they then had people, you know, they actually watched people doing interactions and they coded the behavior. And your behavior when you want to be liked, it's described here as warmth because my colleague says that's nicer. But in the study, they actually call it ingratiating. So it's kind of, again, it's like it's over, it's overdone. And that's what I used to do until Michelle told me I should stop and hit me in the face. Um, so again, it's, it's kind of that overdone way that doesn't seem real or genuine. And it also can seem disrespectful. Because if it's, again, it's often using someone's first name before you're invited to, or just, again, engaging in ways that doesn't seem to recognize them as you know, sort of a peer intellectual as opposed to a person who you know, is going to talk about basketball, becoming very stereotypical. So of course, then, for the black and Latino students, the respect that they were seeking was the body language was seriousness. And that the, red, the white students read as hostility and not liking me. So the interaction, of course, doesn't go well. So they also included Asian Americans in the study. And what was really interesting, in these elite institutions, the Asian American students did presume that they would be respected. So the goal then was to be liked. Of course, then there's a stereotype, if you're Asian American, of not being likable so the work can feel harder. So there's racial navigation to be done, but it's done from a somewhat different perspective. Now, this issue comes up in the healthcare context as well. Because again, if you think about the interaction between healthcare providers and patients, whether or not you're seen as, whether or not the patient feels respected is crucial to actually receiving good care. It's crucial. And this is one of the elements of healthcare that continues to be a challenge. So again, there was an end-of-life study recently that showed that there was less you know, kind of eye contact and less interaction between doctors and patients if they were cross-race. Another sort of, and I'm going to promise I'll end these studies pretty soon, but, uh, but this, one's, this one's really interesting. And again, it's a little counterintuitive, perhaps. So the question is, do we think of, do we experience ambiguous discrimination or blatant discrimination differently depending upon our race or ethnicity? And this, this study at least suggests that we do. So this was, again, college students who were given scenarios to read either of a fair hiring situation where the qualified person gets the job, a blatantly uh, uh, <laughs> Uh, a biased hiring situation where the person who has less qualified, uh, who, who's less qualified, who's white, gets the job, and the person who's in the hiring position says the other person belongs to too many minority organizations. So it was really clear. And then the third was ambiguous. Less qualified person, according to the criteria, who's white, gets the job. The explanation is, well, he took an economics class. So then we look at the cognitive interference that occurs after they read the scenarios. And the cognitive interference is measured by you know, kind of staying on task. And as you can see, the control, the blue, they're both pretty much the same. There's no statistical significance between the white students and the black students. When there's blatant discrimination, for the white students, their cognitive interference is high. There's a ton of noise in their brain. Because again, for many of us who are white, we presume a just world. We think things are supposed to be fair. And so it's very cognitively, you know, sort of, it's, it's dissonance. We experience a lot of dissonance when something happens that's blatantly unfair. For the black students, it's not as though they didn't think it was wrong. Of course they did. But they had a schema, a place in their brain to understand it. And so it, it was clearly a thing that just fit in their brain and they allowed them to stay on task. The ambiguous discrimination is another area where we have a big difference. For the white students, that explanation, we took an economics class. Even though it wasn't a criteria, our brains do this really strong default to fairness, because we assume good intentions. And so for them, it was not discrimination. It was, you know, well, you took an economics class. That was fine. For the black students, by contrast, but wait a minute. Economics wasn't one of the criteria. So this seems problematic. It seems like race is at play. And then there's another <laughs> question. If I say something, will it be believed? So the ambiguous discrimination produces far more cognitive interference. And if we think about the kind of interactions we tend to experience in, you know, outside of deeply uh, racist places, they're often ambiguous. And what this then means is, if you're a person of color, you're sort of in this place of wondering, is it race or isn't it? And that packs in cognitively. So what can be done? Well, there's an enormous amount that institutions can do to create 
sort of a place where identity isn't salient in the way that we've described, where it doesn't feel like if you're a person of color, you're somehow not fitting into the idea of you know, who a real student is. And that's work that the institutions have to do. So it's recognizing, and again, sort of celebrating people and their multi multiplicitous selves. And also this idea of people being seen and truly being seen for who they are and their individual characteristics, but not having that have to reduce and get rid of their racial identity or their, their uh, identity that's uh, based on ethnicity. If for any of us in, an inter in a particular interaction, this sounds so hokey and so cliched, but it actually does remarkable work. If you're about to have an interracial interaction or a cross-group interaction, if you imagine a positive, you think about a positive interaction you've had before, as you walk into this new interaction, it actually does do a lot of work. Again, I know it sounds like something you'd read in a weird self-help book, but the sort of feeling of coming into the interaction, expecting that interaction to go well, makes a difference. You, you, again, your whole body language is different. And the argument we're trying to make largely is that those of us who are white should and could be doing a lot more of this racial navigation. But this can be a tool for people of color, too, who don't want to have to deal with the anxiety of the white person across from them. So anyone can use this because it actually does an enormous amount of work. And the bigger issue, if you have something that's a really important, that like when we talk to you know, public defense attorneys and people who work in the child welfare system, what we say to them, they, they, you know, they, after they hear about this like versus respected study, some of them are really, they feel a sense of they're jarred because they realize they've met families uh, who've had their children removed from them. And their goal is to make those families feel welcome and feel warm. So they're informal and they wear their jeans and they, you know, sort of try and mirror the language. And the people are stone cold and feel extraordinarily distant. And suddenly they realize that tact was seen as very disrespectful, calling people by their first names upon the first encounter. So for people who have then a fair amount of racial anxiety in a really consequential interaction, having a script, not like obviously a script that you read because that's weird, but having you know, sort of a sequence of how you're going to interact with someone, recognizing you know, sort of certain entry points that will connote that respect that's so crucial could actually make a big difference. And then there's finally learning the triggers and acknowledging the mistakes. So I have to say, I was sort of surprised, I've been on the road doing this for a couple of years now, at how frequently, apparently, people who look like me touch people's hair. We seem to have real boundary issues. So again, not a thing, not a thing we should do. Don't touch people's hair. It's like their hair, it's their body. And the other thing that we did recently is we actually did a study of the implicit and or explicit bias against black women wearing their hair in nat natural textured styles. And we found, as we hypothesized, that there was a fair amount of implicit bias. What we were surprised about was that there was actually quite a bit of explicit bias. But the good news on this is there are you know, sort of online natural hair communities where everyone's bias level was far lower. So it really is possible. Again, there is actually hope for all of this to get uh, better in serious ways. So the final <laughs> concept, and I, I'm going to take my seven minutes, and I really hope that I get to hear from you and I get to hear your voices, because I'm looking at faces and I'm trying to figure out what you're thinking, so I can't wait. Um, the final concept, is again, is a really important one because it helps us understand what we may have experienced and not have a name for. So I'm going to describe my own experience with it. Uh, again, Michelle gave you my whole bio in a way that made me really embarrassed and I think like threw me off for the first 10 minutes because I felt so silly. Um, but after, you know, but after law school, I, you know, I was in New York and I clerked for this judge and I had this job at this small law firm that was doing really great land use work and environmental justice work, which is why I went there. It's actually when I met Michelle. And most of the partners I got along with pretty well and felt pretty comfortable with. Uh, but I come from an Irish, uh, as I said, I'm Irish Catholic and also working class. Dad was a roofer. My mom spent time as a sheet metal worker. So in New York, I was a little bit weird. Like I didn't know some of the norms of behavior that other people knew. And that was fine most of the time. But at that law firm, there was one partner who was literally the son of a senator and descended from people from the Mayflower. He wore bow ties unironically. He knew when to wear his sh white shoes. And I felt when he looked at me like he thought I hadn't washed that day. Like he just had this disdainful expression on his face. And again, I have no idea what the man was actually thinking, but I felt the sense of disdain. And when the work I gave to this man literally had typos, like I'd been this law review geek, and this was all I cared about at that time in my life was typos, and I would get these little assignments from him, and they wouldn't be good. And the work that I gave to everybody else, which was far more challenging, apparently was quite good. And it was this weird dynamic, and the more I you know, got nervous about it, the worse the work got. 
And finally, there was, you know, the firm had a big project, and one of the people who actually thought I was good gave me this really challenging project, and I worked all through the weekend and thought it was going to Steve, this guy I, you know, was comfortable with. And of course, Mr. Bowtie comes in, and he's wearing his seersucker suit, and it's Sunday after Fourth of July weekend, and now I really haven't showered, and I'm actually being completely literal. Three days in the office, right? Th those happen. So he comes in, and he looks at me, and you can see this look on his face, like, they could not have given her this project. And I'm thinking to him, oh my god. So he takes the document, and he takes every document upon which I relied, and he disappears for three hours. Undoubtedly, as frankly I would, checking every single thing that I did. And he came out, and he said, I wouldn't have thought you capable of such fine work. But then I was free. I was free, and my work actually became okay, but I was experiencing stereotype threat. My class identity was triggered, even though, again, it probably was known largely to me, but when a negative stereotype is triggered about a part of your identity that is serious to you, and particularly if it's triggered in a context that you care about, and I cared so much about doing a good job as a lawyer, if that's triggered, it can really have powerful effects. It's not like a choking. It's not just being nervous in the traditional way. It's cognitively diverting resources from the task at hand. It's taking your brain's resources and directing it toward managing this anxiety. Your heart rate increases. Your blood pressure rises. It's a real thing. And what's amazing about it, and again, self-monitor, self-doubt, there's a whole bunch of effects. What's amazing about it is it leads to real differences, particularly in test. You know, sort of the standardized test is like the perfect place, the perfect storm for, for a stereotype threat to come up. So this is an example of a calculus test where women in one context were told, this is a test where men and women perform equally. And needless to say, they did. Another group weren't told anything, and you can see how different their performance was. This can also happen to white men. This is not something that's simply, you know, that's just for those of us who are you know, potentially seen as a non-dominant group. For white men who were at Stanford, math majors, cared a lot, were being contrasted to, who thought they were being contrasted to Asian American men, they performed worse on their tests. So it's a really powerful phenomena that, again, some of you may have experienced. And we'll uh, talk a little bit about what we can do about it. And there's a final sort of version of this that can have real harm and that's, again, this worry about seeming racist. What has been found is that, and this is a study of teachers, middle school teachers were sent um, intentionally badly written essays. This was kind of the opposite of the other one, intentionally badly written essays. And what they found was middle school teachers gave different levels of feedback to black and Latino and white students. The white student would get more critical feedback. The black and Latino would get kind of you know, generic praise. But there was one exception to that. The teachers who were in schools where they felt like they were supported and they felt confident in their environment gave black students the same level of feedback. They still gave Latino students different levels of feedback, suggesting two different phenomena. For the Latino students, it was implicit bias. It was at lower expectations because of some sort of presumption about English language capacity, perhaps. For the African American students, it was their worry about seeming racist that they didn't have when they were in an institution where they felt supported. So again, for all of us, this is something that can be actually navigated. And the way it can be navigated, you know, it's this work that we can do as individuals. Then what has to happen ideally is sort of those who are in power will take the steps to do is, you know, in an odd sort of way what that partner did with me when he finally told me I did fine work, is actually see us and see the work that we can do and share it with us. So the way this works is, the way this, this study worked is, is uh, groups of students were told to write essays, and they were asked to give pictures. And they were told if it was a really good essay, it would be published in a magazine. One group of students were just sent back very critical feedback. The second group, were, were, uh, they had shared with them critical feedback plus kind of generic phrase. The third group had what we call wise feedback, which was an invocation of high expectations. I expect the best from you. We're only going to look for the best. And then crucially, specific descriptions of where in the writing the person saw the work being good. This is why I think you can meet those expectations. And then all the same criticism as everybody else. And what, this is a measure of motivation. So for the black students, the pure criticism, there was a worry. There was a reasonable worry, frankly, that the criticism was biased. Right? We saw the study of the memo, where sometimes criticism is biased. 
And so there's low task motivation. This person doesn't care about me. They're not going to treat me seriously. They're not going to be able to read my work and value it. The praise helped a little. But what really helped and where the black student's motivation was actually higher was with this invocation of excellence. So there's this you know, sort of set of interventions that can, be, uh, that can be sort of rendered that can be really valuable. I'm just going to emphasize a couple of them that explain why you know, sort of having extraordinarily representative teachers in front of you or students around you are so important. If for each of our different identities, there are peer experts or there are experts you know, sort of in front of the class, then our identity isn't salient in that domain. It makes a big difference. If for us as individuals, if we can think of the task as a task not about someone judging us as humans, we can do some of that work ourselves. So there's, again, changing the local environment a little bit. And, and all of this can help. But the main thing, I guess, to take away from this, hopefully, is if you've experienced something like I described, it's a real thing. And it's, in a sense, hopefully, that understanding that this kind of phenomena combination of implicit bias, racial anxiety, and stereotype threat may help to explain for each of us, depending upon how we're situated, why even though consciously we want to sort of have positive experiences cross-group, they can be hard. But the hope is in engaging in these strategies, you can sort of move past the difficulty and, again, have the intergroup relations that are the ultimate way to reduce bias. So I'm really looking forward to questions, challenges, feedback, and thank you for listening so attentively. I guess first, thank you. Uh, that was comprehensive and worthy of the comprehensive introduction you got. So you, you covered a lot of ground, and it was insightful. So in, in all earnest, thank you. Um, so I have uh, basically three comments slash questions that may push back a little bit on cer certain concepts. Uh, the first is how the Irish became white. France, Windance, Twine, and Jonathan Warren, they have a different perspective where they argue that it's the presence of blacks and distancing from blacks that allowed whites, that allowed Irish and other groups to become white. So it was, it was kind of juxtaposed in, in a sense of, um, we'll take an intermediary position at some point in time with the hopes of integration eventually for political purposes, which is why the white dominant class would want them in in there to, to increase their political num numeracy, but at the expense of blacks, that, that, that that's explicit. And I guess that might have some insights on, will democracy necessarily save us going forward? Um, I guess the, the other two points, and I'll be brief, uh, one is related to, uh, now we're in a paradigm where whites are starting to perceive blacks as not as uh, as more affluent than they actually are. I guess there's that, that new study, and, and that might even relate to the case in Deaton mortality stu studies where whites are concerned about their relative position in a way that they perceive blacks as encroaching upon their perhaps privileged domain. And then the last thing is some of these examples we can, it seems evident that it's implicit bias. For example, when you do the test and you look at reaction times and you, you prime people with certain images. Um, but for others, how do we know it's just not plain old explicit bias? How, do, you know, how, do we, how can we really make a distinction between the law firm reading when they know the memo is written by a black person versus a white person that they simply are, especially in a context of we know that bigotry is associated with, with moral ineptitude, so what, what, it, it might be a way of disguising oneself by coming up with other narratives when, in fact, they are explicit bigots. And I, I'd say in, in the economic sense, I think of it when we label things as statistical discrimination. How do we know it's just not plain old discrimination sometimes? Thank you. So I think the, for the first question, I think what we said was actually completely in concordance. So the reason, you know, why did the government suddenly pour all this money into working class white people? Like, the, again, there had been working class Irish and poor Irish people in this country for hundreds of years, and they were, again, sort of 
if you look at South Boston, for example, they were in, you know, sort of living in squalor. Why did that suddenly change? And I think the argument for why it changed is exactly the argument you just made, which is suddenly you had uh, this, you know, essentially Roosevelt made a new deal that was, you know, sort of a pact with the devil, where they were, you know, sort of the, the idea of government expanding was accepted so long as it literally excluded African Americans from it. So this explains why Social Security didn't go to people who were engaging in agricultural work or doing domestic work, which again, actually the Irish did a lot of domestic work at that time too, but the availability of other better government benefits made a difference. So I think what we're talking, what you know, the sort of arguments that they would make would be exactly consistent with the arguments that, you know, sort of, I guess we would make in terms of the, the, the way that suddenly you had a group uh, expand from sort of white, white being WASP, white being white Protestants, like my, my partner friend, to white being anyone who has a certain phenotype. So I think they're actually exactly alike. And I think you raise a, a really powerful and important and challenging point uh, in your sort of concern that demography isn't going to change the power dynamics in our country. And certainly John Powell, who's the chair of our board and who does a lot of enormous amount of work in this space, has, an, has concern that what we're going to continue to see is anti-black racism and essentially sort of something like a, a Brazilian kind of color line that's going to descend upon us because the group that can be sort of treated as white will just expand. And I think that's the work that all of us have to do together to prevent from happening because obviously to sort of keep these lines uh, present will kind of rot the core of our country in the way that we're seeing now. Um, so okay, so that was question one and question two. Uh, with respect to how do we know, so, so in some instances, the way the test is constructed, as you said, you know, there again, and there are a bunch of other studies that we can talk about too, you know the reason for it is just reaction time, and so it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a unconscious processes. In other instances, it's true, for example, that the field study involving doctors and children in the emergency room, it could be that those doctors are just bigots. And you're right, it could be that the law firm partners are just bigots. I think the argument that would suggest that to a significant degree, it's likely to be implicit bias would be for the law firm, frankly, there's an economic imperative right now. There's, some, there's corporations that are pushing law firms to have more diverse representation. And it's actually been, it's, it's a real economic um, demand. And so, Law firms, according to their self-interest, actually would be far better off if they had much higher percentages of associates of color. They're getting pushed hard appropriately by certain of their clients to have more diverse, you know, sort of again, both gender and race and ethnicity. So it's a it's an economic imperative as well as the law firm partners, certainly in the way that they self-describe, in the way that they sort of, you know, put themselves into the world. Being fair is important to them. Now, does that mean they don't have any bias? You know, who knows? But in terms of the, the, the way that the, they responded to that memo, as I said, if that memo had been perfect, they would have been, you know, hooray, because they're looking to increase the diversity in their ranks. Again, I'm not saying they're sort of good people in every possible way, but that's, I guess, I think the combination of an economic imperative as well as how people want to conceive of themselves largely in the legal profession that suggests that it's not a conscious process that's leading to that particular outcome. And I will tell you that sort of once that study was made known, law firms are now doing a ton of implicit bias trainings trying to you know, kind of end this phenomena. The worry that we would say is just having you know, one experience where you learn about implicit bias isn't going to do anything about that phenomena. There's got to be a lot more work that's done that includes structural work and includes, you know, again, having peer experts and, and truly diversifying. So, that, that's what we would argue. Again, I can't prove that I'm right, but I think there's, there's reason to believe that these unconscious processes are at work, to, at least for some percentage or some significant percentage of the people involved. Thank you so much. Um, looking at this last slide uh, in, in terms of depictions um, and offering counter stereotypes, could you talk a little bit about the role of media and film and how those types of images either reinforce these stereotypes or change these stereotypes? And what kinds of images you feel are necessary today 
to be produced to help us either counter these stereotypes or, or create varied depictions? So thank you, it's a great question. And actually one of my questions to Michelle is, should we include some of the narrative work that we're doing? And basically I would obviously have been droning on for another hour and perhaps you would have gotten sick of listening to me. Uh, so, <laughs> so, um, so no, it's a great question. And it, it's, it's, we, so we did, uh, we've done a couple of studies on this. One is the pop justice sort of uh, literature review that we did. And we also did a, um, a, a study of, have any of you seen Halal in the Family? The webisode? So, I, well, it's actually even funnier than that in a way. So, Asif Manvi and some of his, people know who Asif Manvi is from Stephen Colbert? So, he and some of his colleagues decided to put together a series of webisodes that would, you know, this is a couple of years ago and trying to address Islamophobia. And so, they wanted to have some sort of relatable families that were dealing with issues of anti Muslim discrimination with humor. And the question was also, well, again, first it was called um, The Cosby Show. That had to change. <laughs> So this, for those of you who actually watch The Cosby Show, which maybe you're too young to have done, Asif Manvi does wear a sweater that looks a lot like the Bill Cosby sweater, but needless to say, the name had to change at a certain point. So, um, so they asked us to do a study first. The study was a study within the Muslim community to determine whether or not this would be offensive to people who were self-identified as Muslim. So we did that study first. And because, you know, comedy can obviously be you know, sort of a little bit edgy, and they were being edgy. The second was what we called a do no harm study. So, so we wanted to, we did a national online study to make sure that these webisodes didn't increase Islamophobia before it was fully released. And then, ap then after it was released, we did a much larger study where we looked at does it actually, you know, reduce implicit bias compared to a control. And we decided for our control, it had to be comedic because we had to see was it sort of the specific depictions of the people in these webisodes that decreased the bias or was it just laughing because actually laughing has positive salutary effects in all sorts of ways. So we, we had to find something that didn't involve sex or violence or race and so we ended up with Everybody Loves Raymond. So we compared it to the Everybody Loves Raymond and found it did decrease bias both implicit and explicit, as well as, and this is really crucial, it increased concern about discrimination against Muslims. Just watching these little webisodes had, at least for that moment, that effect. Now, whether it's, it's probably not long term, but there's actually, what we concluded after doing the, the, the literature survey is, one of the things that's a risk is exceptionalizing. Right, like there've always been, you know, there's always been a few, Sidney Poitier, for example, there's always been a few actors of color who are sort of lionized, but if you just have a few, it's the exception. And so it can't be exceptionalized characters, and actually the Cosby Show may not have done much in any positive sense for race relations, because in some sense they were, off, you know, they were seen as sort of so in their own unique universe that people's warmth toward the Cosby Show didn't actually extrapolate broadly into society. So the argument would be that, in, in a sense, the depictions have to be real, authentic, complicated human beings of the kind that we all are to begin to, again, break through the, the way that cross race often we don't see each other in complicated ways. So it's a great question. Thank you. I uh, interject with a question before we, uh, so I'm interested on the, about the social science research on the social science researchers. Uh, academia, university, um, I'm interested in if you could talk to us a little bit about bias and perceptions that you uh, have been able to study and talk with people about in uh, the university setting. Okay, okay. Tell me if you're asking about the studies of the bias studies, or are you asking about the the bias across within groups of social scientists? Because yes. both are interesting questions. The latter? The latter. Okay. Um, so certainly what Michelle has identified is a phenomena that is prevalent and there are some amazingly accomplished, phenomenally successful academics who are doing this work who have not been recognized in their field the way they ought. And so the, the sort of one of the things that's that becomes so hard is people within a field are finding these phenomena and identifying them and it's happening you know, in the world that they're existing in and they don't see it as applied to themselves. So if that's what you're asking about, there certainly is, again, way more, and this is anecdotal because of course they're not studying themselves. Um, so if that's what you're asking about, it is certainly a phenomena of great concern, particularly because, and it's ironic, the presence of faculty of color 
across our faculty, you know, across every dimension of identity has been identified as probably the most effective way to reduce bias of anything. And so the, the effect of not following their own directions and sort of, again, viewing each other through these lenses of bias is work to be done, <laughs> work to be done. Oh, sorry. It's on, I promise. Um, so you talked a little bit about, oh, okay. You talked, um, you talked a little bit about anti-blackness. Um, I also would be interested to hear about sort of intra-communal um, stereotypes and biases, right? We, we often talk about like people outside of our community view us like this. Um, and that's something that I peers, right? From people and talks about, you know, up in the high because he was thing, but his was something else, right? And so what the information around intrapersonal um, um, before we start, you know, aisle or whatever. Thank you. Could you repeat the question? Just so, so the question, and I'm so sorry that the mic was going on and off because the, the question is really important. The question was, what what does the research say about the bias that works within communities of color, within and specifically into thinking about anti-black racism, the way that skin tone and Afrocentricity features and other ways of how people are identified can affect how people are treated within, again, the group who are socially identified as black. It's, they're actually, there's a lot of research that I'm sure you know about, um, about the incredible power and the incredible uh, actually difference in kind that dark skinned, uh, th that, that skin tone and Afrocentricity features make, for example, in the criminal justice context. Now, what is, so, so there's, there were two studies that are really, um, again, like beyond, uh, you know, sh shockingly awful. Uh, one was in Florida, there, there was uh, Jen Jennifer Eberhardt, who's done a lot of this work. She was a MacArthur Genius uh, Award winner. She's at Stanford. She did a, uh, she heard that a study was done of sentencing in Florida, and they didn't actually find much in the way of race disparities in sentences. And she was suspicious of the finding. So what she had her graduate students do is go through, in Florida, apparently they have pictures of anyone who's imprisoned for a felony conviction. So she had her graduate students go and code all of those pictures for skin tone and Afrocentricity of features. And what they found was both skin tone and separately Afrocentricity of features were the essentially bases for the sentencing disparities. And that included white people, people who would be identified as white but had Afrocentric features. They too were sentenced more harshly, not to the same degree, but to some degree. So it was at an average an eight month longer sentence. And then there was another study done of death penalty convictions in uh, Philadelphia that showed when it was a a crime that was within community, that didn't matter. The, uh, facial, the, the facial features and skin tone didn't matter. But if it was a white you know, victim and a black defendant, then facial features and uh, skin tone mattered for whether or not people were likely to get the death penalty. But that doesn't answer your question, right? Because all of that, we don't, in terms of the people who are engaged in the discriminatory actions, it's probably mostly white, because at that point, the judges were mostly white. But it's certainly, the, so, for example, there's a judge uh, who I work with who, when she started hearing about this work, she's an African-American woman, she's, you know, she's, ex she's a family court judge, and she started hearing about this work, and it's just driving her constantly because she's thinking about the fact of children being removed from homes because of race, and that's terrifying. So she's really pushing this work into, into the, the judiciary, but she's also said she realized as a judge, She's light skinned. She has very kind of, you know, sort of very fine features. She has straight hair and she has a sort of upper class bearing. She realized 
what are my biases? What am I bringing into the room when I'm interacting? What are people seeing in me that may trigger them? And so she she has this you know sort of this bench card that she uses, and she's been particularly conscious that there may be ways in which skin tone and Afrocentricity features may be affecting her. And she basically, whenever she's making a really consequential decision, she does something we call flip the script. So she imagines someone who looks like her son and says, would I do the same? But again, as you know, there hasn't been um, as much study as there needs to be for, from, so, you know, in so many different areas, more needs to be done. But I think one of the things that perception does, so I'm going to thank you for that question on multiple levels, is we hear, you know, when we hear people talk about uh, this research from the audience, we think, what work needs to be done? And it sounds, I think you're right, because we hear this concern all, you know, regularly, this, this work needs to be studied from that perspective. So thank you. Okay, I'll talk up. I'll talk up. So you put a suggestion for us when we're going to cross interact to have some positive thoughts beforehand. And I think for white people, that's probably a pretty good idea. I'm worried to ask a black person to let their guard down when really they have no reason to. So I guess I would say a couple things. One is um, I'm very mindful as a white woman standing up there at that audience. I'm not kind of asking anyone to do anything, right? Because who would I be to do that? But I think that there's, there actually is, I think we all should have the availability to us of all the tools of power that we have. And if you are, so for example, when I work with, when I work with lawyers, and I had a lawyer in legal aid, an African American lawyer say to me, what can I do in New York housing court or in you know, New York family court or in New York juvenile court for my clients when I, there might be bias against me as a black woman? And my, the research suggests and experience bears out that most, well, so most judges in New York perceive of themselves as liberal. White liberals love to be liked by people of color. So what I said to her is, I'm not telling you to do this. Like, the, who would I be to you know, push this navigation on you? But if you want a tool, we often become rather pathetic in our response because it's, you know, again, we feel like more moral human beings. So I guess I think that we all need to have available to us every tool that we can put in our toolbox. And so knowing that there's some power to being the person who comes in as a person of color to someone white, if that person has power over you or power over someone you care about or power over a situation, to use, I mean, frankly, I saw this woman use this to enormous success because it's power, it's a form of power. And I know it's not institutional power and it's not structural power, but in that individual moment, if that individual you know, sort of interaction matters, I think, it's, I think I have to share what the science says will happen and people can choose to use it, for, you know, use it or not, if that's fair. As I, uh, as I said, our first class, when I walk into a, a room, I have to own every piece of who I am. And I think the, the tool that you just expressed, Rachel, is a tool that I can use as the identity of a African American person. There are other tools that I need to use as a woman or as a Caribbean American or as uh, somebody that has you know, very distinct black African features or has uh, you know, natural hair. So um, it's just the tools in the toolbox, I think, are very important. Thank you very much. Um, I um, happen to have, um, this was very inspiring because I have two classrooms that are full of of very anxious students this semester, and um, that was really um, something that I'm just going to pack in my backpack right now and and bring to the classroom. Uh, right, starting you know the next class that's going to to happen uh, in two days. But um, the question that I have is actually uh, different. I would like to uh, hear more a little bit about these these protocols and how what's the process of coming up with them. Um, when you say protocols, referring to the studies that we engage in or something else? Uh, well, the protocols as, as change that is being brought as a result to, of, of the awareness of, uh, of biases. So it's a great question. And unfortunately, many of the, uh, like I said, there's a lot of implicit bias training that's going on that's not being studied at all, which I think is appalling. So what we've actually started to do is find, 
it, for a while, I felt like I was sort of doing movie trailers all around the country, like I was hopping from place to pay, place and doing hour-long speeches and trying to like make it a song and dance to get people interested in doing the work. But I tried to be really clear, you know, don't check the box, you know, you're not done. And so the next step is then to bring, do a systems diagnostic to figure out from an institutional perspective, what are the areas of real risk? What are, the, what, what are the protocols that you can come up with that will prevent against the worst things from happening? What are the groups of people of power doing to prevent the harm from accruing? And then, and we've actually worked with one healthcare provider for two years, and it, it, one of the things they were looking at was, do clients feel like they're, you know, do patients rather, feel like they're being respected, treated with dignity, and do they feel as though the encounter was one that was overall positive with the healthcare provider? That was our big question. And we were really, really happy. And you know, again, external, someone else did the study. We didn't do it on ourselves. They found that right after the, the like all day workshops and then the sort of follow up work, they found you know, sort of the, there, there was an uptick in the people of color who came to those clinics feeling as though they were treated with fairness and respect and again, a sense of dignity. And then they did another uh, look at it six months later and they found the results still held. So that was the first kind of study of whether this can make any difference. We've got a, another project with two different school districts that's just about to start, and we're also working with some criminal justice stakeholders. So we're looking now to do the kind of what will actually follow, what will make a difference in tr institutional settings that matter. But finding you know, entities that will open themselves up to study is, is challenging, and we give everyone credit who's doing it, but a lot, you know, to, to Michelle's point, oftentimes those, you know, we don't want to be studied. So, all right. No further questions. I want to thank Professor Gotzel for her time and information.